Welcome, everyone. Um, I am Anatole Levin. I'm director of the Eurasia program at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Uh, for those of you not uh, acquainted with Quincy, uh, we are a Washington think tank dedicated to promoting restraint in US foreign security policy, uh, opposing uh, wars of intervention, and generally working uh, to the best of our ability for cooperation and peace in the world. And it gives me great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Nikolai Petro, uh, who is one of the world's, and this is said without flattery, greatest experts on Ukraine, uh, and especially on the internal politics and the questions of rival identities in Ukraine. Uh, Nikolai is a professor at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, he has received two Fulbright grants for research in Ukraine and in Russia. And he is author of the book, which we will discuss today, The Tragedy of Ukraine. And I thought uh, I would begin uh, by asking you about that title, because tragedy these days is, is generally used in a, in, a, in a very, you know, loose and flabby fashion to mean anything very bad. But you use it uh, in the classical uh, fashion, as of course it was, as it it originated. And so I'd like to begin by asking, why have you cast uh, Ukraine in this light of, of classical tragedy? And what does classical tragedy tell us, you know, about the situation of Ukraine today? Uh, thank you for inviting me, Anatole. Um, yes, that is the perspective that I use, the framework that I came to, to understand this long-term reiterating conflict that I saw uh, over many years of visiting Ukraine. And um, <clears throat> why tragedy? Um, well, because it was the only method that I could apply that made sense of the events. Uh, in a his, particularly in a historical perspective. And uh, I shouldn't, it's not that I'm applying tragedy exclusively to Ukraine. I'm applying it and trying to bring back the value of tragedy to understanding politics more generally. And if we go back to the classical realist theorists of <clears throat> the mid uh, 20th century, people like Reinhold Niebuhr, Hans Morgenthau, George Kennan, and others, then um, to them, tragedy in its classical sense would have made uh, eminent sense because they understood the application of power, which is the essence of politics, to be a, a tragic endeavor. Um, I think Morgenthau specifically said, there is no way to escape violence in the application of power. You may be doing it for good reasons. Most people usually think they are doing it for good reasons, but that nevertheless doesn't eliminate the repercussions. And that is, in the, that is inherent in the nature of, um, of the political endeavor, of, of, of the task of politics. So uh, I originally came to the idea uh, by reading Richard Ned Liebau's Tragic Vision of Politics. But, a book uh, I greatly admire myself, by the way. And Liebau, who was a student of Morgenthau's, as was my dissertation uh, director, they actually were in the same seminar together, um, Liebau discusses the importance of tragedy in the context of international politics. And it just seemed to me that it could be expanded from there to domestic politics, particularly because um, the Greek city-states and, and Greek culture generally um, endured quite a bit of tragedy within its own community. It actually didn't see the tragedy uh, applied to the barbarians, but really the tragedy was among the Greeks themselves. 
the, the fighting. So uh, that seemed to be very apropos. And then from that understanding, I simply dug deeper and deeper into um, the political cultures that exist and have always existed within Ukraine. Uh, and I wed the two together to understand the recurrence uh, of this conflict, again, within Ukraine. And over the span of Ukrainian history, which is fraught with internal conflicts, these, uh, this internal conflict has been taken advantage of multiple times by external actors. So this latest phase from 2014 to 2022 and beyond is nothing new for Ukraine. It actually reproduces the type of interaction that, that um, the Ukrainian polity has had with uh, its foreign neighbors uh, in, uh, during World War I, during World War II, um, and, uh, and, well, before and after as well. So it all came together in that sense and made sense to me that way. Uh, by the way, sorry, just to interject, um, uh, Nikolai and I will talk with each other for um, the next 20 minutes or so, and then I will uh, throw it open to questions from the floor. And if you have questions, please enter them, some of you have done so already, uh, in the Q&A um, and question and answer, and uh, I will then pass them on to Nikolai. Uh, we have one question already, actually, which perhaps you could expand on a bit, which is, uh, could you define tragedy? Uh, for the, uh, yeah. the the audience. Okay, so um, to me, uh, so I came across. Uh, I, I rely a lot on Raymond Williams, and um, he has a very good uh, way of defining it, which I don't have before me. But um, it uh, it boils down to this: tragedy is the result of. Uh, individuals and communities not recognizing how they themselves contrib are contributing, their actions themselves are contributing to the outcome that they least desire. They don't see how their own actions are contributing to the catastrophe. And uh, what I especially valued about this uh, classical definition of what tragedy entails is that it weds the concepts of individual agency to the outcome. Uh, in other words, tragedy is precisely not what happens to the uninvolved and the uninitiated. It is precisely our choice to do things, the consequences of which we do not think through, or sometimes when, when we encounter we continue to do the same thing in the name of abstract ideals, like a, a favorite one that often leads to tragedy, and uh, as I understand it, is justice. Because the, the pursuit of justice um, at, at the cost of all other values usually boils down to the, to the search for vengeance. And it is precisely vengeance that builds and renews the cycle of tragedy again for the next generation. We often, uh, we often fool ourselves when we have resolved, seemingly resolved a crisis um, by suppressing our opponents or getting, putting them out of sight somehow, uh, removing them from our political, political discourse, political environment, not recognizing how in doing so, we are feeding the next generation to seek redress of their grievances. And again, when I look at not just Ukrainian history, but the history of many conflicts, this, uh, this seems to be a recurring pattern. We prefer temporary solutions to the difficult um, uh, moral regeneration that is required uh, in true tragedy, in, 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 in true reconciliation, which is seeing 
ourselves in our enemies and understanding how we ourselves, our own actions, contributed to the response of our enemy. I take it from that that you would be an opponent uh, of the, the argument that uh, we need to back Ukraine to total victory in order to punish Russia uh, for the invasion. And I assume you would also be skeptical of the uh, demands, proposals from multiple sources that Putin and other members of the Russian government face an international tribunal for war crimes? Well, uh, I, I'm not sure what I think about very specific initiatives, but I can say because it flows from uh, the history of the Peloponnesian Wars on to the present, that the quest uh, for total victory uh, in Greek uh, thinking is universally condemned, is universally condemned as necessarily leading to the reproduction of the tragic cycle in the future. There is, and, and this again, when we, when we talk about the influence that tragedy has had on political realism, it is precisely the recognition that evil will never be eliminated from the world. Never, never, never. Therefore, the task of statesmen is precisely to manage our relations with uh, the groups and individuals that um, we find most objectionable um, in order to cultivate the, the maximum benefit that we can for for the, for the for international politics. Um, I mean, let me just say, I, I think uh, th there is no uh, perfect solution. It's, it's an ongoing uh, uh, endeavor. It also presumes that there is no one nation or no one group of nations that can claim moral, a complete moral authority. There is morality on all sides of every conflict. To, to greater, well, the determination of, to that is best left to philosophers and historians of future generations removed from the conflict. Yes, I, I must say, uh, as a, uh, someone who was trained as a historian myself and studied, for example, the origins of the First World War, uh, I. I would hope that we don't have to wait a hundred years uh, to gain, you know, a more objective and, you know, cool-headed analysis uh, of, um, uh, of of this war. I mean, reading your book, Nikolai, it struck me that another way in which um, the conflict, as you see it, has analogies with tragedy in the theatre uh, is that. Contrary to most con current Western portrayals, which simply see this as a as a war of uh, outside aggression by Russia against Ukraine, um, you see this uh, also in a way as a kind of family conflict um, between actors who are who have been intimately connected to each other and entwined with each other. Would that be a uh, an, an accurate way of, of seeing your, your, your analysis. Yes. yes. And I hasten to add that I do see the, the reality of Russian aggression. It, there is that. It's that I believe there are multiple issues at work. And if one were to imagine, for example, I've argued in the past, and I, I think I I would still come down on this. If Russian, if, if Russia were to somehow magically withdraw entirely from Ukraine, although I suppose it would still exist on there where it is, but if it were to withdraw entirely, the internal contradictions would still be there. And they would lead to 
um, different sorts of problems, but uh, in many ways, problems that are related to the conflict in which we, uh, we are now embroiled, in which at least Europeans are now, largely speaking, uh, all Europeans are embroiled because uh, there is, uh, I've argued, an external component to the conflict. Uh, there is this identity crisis and conflict between uh, Russian intellectuals who form Russian identity and Ukrainian intellectuals who are trying to and have in the past and will continue to form Ukraine's identity, um, often uh, off uh, setting themselves apart from the other. Uh, th that's one way to, to create an identity for yourself. And of course, the same process inside, uh, which has two distinct visions, uh, one in Western uh, Ukraine of a Ukraine, uh, the, the true Ukraine being a Galician identity, a, a, lar a Galician identity a writ large and extended as far as it can uh, be to the East. And those who do not accept that Galician identity as not being properly Ukrainian, and uh, in the east and south, the regions uh, I'm uh, most familiar with, uh, of course, who say, well, no, we're perfectly fine being Ukrainians of a different sort, but we are thoroughly Ukrainian. However, our Ukrainian identity is not one that seeks to deny the role that Russian culture, Russian language, and our common uh, Orthodox religion have played in the formation of our Ukrainian identity. And uh, uh, that divide continues. I don't, so people sometimes ask, hasn't the war changed this? Wars do change, but they do not change for very long uh, social attitudes. What changes social attitudes over the long term is the government policies that are enacted in peacetime to promote whatever cultural identity uh, it is chosen or preferred. And um, um, the reason I am skeptical, one of the reasons I'm skeptical of the possibility of successfully trans, of, of ultimately betting on the uh, success of the Galician uh, viewpoint on Ukrainian identity as, as basically eliminating uh, its, its competitor in the East is that uh, the policies of the Ukraine, the official policy of the Ukrainian government for roughly 30 years has been exactly that to uh, limit, constrain, and eventually end or eliminate, transform um, this uh, 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 alternative uh, Ukrainian identity uh, close to Russia that um, as late as 2021 could be said to uh, be uh, the view of roughly 40% of the population. And I use one particular marker for that, which is, of course, uh, Putin's speech in which he said Russians and Ukrainians are one people. And then a survey was done in Ukraine asking, identifying that this was a statement that Putin had made and how many people uh, in Ukraine agree with this. Nationwide, it was 41%. And in the East and South, it was two thirds. Now, this is uh, one and a half years ago. Um, and so, but there is definitely a rally around the flag uh, phenomenon right now. I just am tremendously skeptical of the value of surveys taken in the midst of a conflict. I see them as basically without value. <laughs>
I suppose, I mean, much will also depend on the, the, the success, the economic and the cultural uh, success of the Ukrainian state. Uh, I always remember one Ukrainian friend saying to me that um, we, we will know our independence is secure uh, when um, people start listening to pop songs in Ukrainian. Uh, rather than Russian, which was the case until relatively recently. But there is, I suppose, an irony here, because the success uh, of the Ukrainian state will depend uh, heavily on bringing the war to an end, because, of course, as long as the war goes on, the Ukrainian economy will continue to be devastated. And a huge part of the Ukrainian population, of course, has become refugees. But also, the success of the Ukrainian state will depend heavily on movement towards membership of the European Union. Uh, but the European Union, uh, at least officially, is uh, a project directed against ethnic nationalism. Uh, and uh, so uh, this strikes me as a, well, to put it mildly, an interesting question for the future. Yeah. Well, it's interesting uh, the way you, your question started with saying uh, Ukrainian independence will be secured when uh, Ukrainians, um, especially young people, decide to listen to songs in Ukrainian, pop songs in Ukrainian rather than Russian. And I, th I agree with that entirely, but I would also add, and rather than English, <laughs> and rather than German, in other words, really de devoting their themselves to um, to indigenous uh, the development of, of indigenous culture uh, and understanding its values in contrast to any other that is offered. I, I don't want to sound like a, 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 like a, like I have a, a sort of ethnic monopoly myself. It's just that. Um, there should be an equal appreciation uh, of, um, of of Ukrainian uh, as compared to um, what is on offer, I would say, by the West, as well as Russia. Returning to your broader point, I know it's unpopular to say now, but I am following to some extent uh, in the footsteps of an essay uh, a short essay that Jacques Attali, uh, the founding director of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, wrote not very long ago in a French newspaper, in which he said, quite rightly, I think, that it's hard to envision Ukrainian prosperity outside of a European context that includes Russia. And I've always argued that for Ukraine, given all of the history, not just the history of the war, uh, I don't see any alternative for uh, Ukraine to return to prosperity without massive Russian investment. Uh, I still, I still think that Russian is that investment. Is just to finish this point, I still think that Russian investment were it to be allowed and encouraged in Ukraine, would be much more eager to come than the alternative uh, uh, Western uh, sources investing. I, I see the, the, the aid being offered are impressive in numbers, but in the context of an economy, of a national economy, it's a pittance. What really will allow Ukraine to revive is not the aid that is doled out by international funding, much of which will have to be repaid, but private investment, private investors that say, Ukraine is a place I wish to invest for 20, 30 years and more, and I want to build an entire network, et cetera. And uh, the countries that historically, culturally have an interest in that are not to the West. They are to the east of Ukraine, with the exception of Poland. But Poland, as we both know, is playing its own long game in Ukraine. 
and is primarily interested in the lost, what they call the lost territories to the east, which is Western Ukraine. But I mean, it would seem that the European Union ruled out that option as long ago as 2013, when they rejected suggestions from, by Romano Prodi, amongst others, yeah. that they make an attempt to balance you know, Russian and, uh, and EU economic connections. And that, um, that is one of the, to use, to overuse the word tragedy, that is one of the, uh, colloquially speaking, tragic aspects of this, that we are talking about a policy that, that will delay Ukraine's recovery, in, in my opinion. I, as, uh, I wish to be as clear about this as, as, as I can be. I don't see any prospect for, um, for meaningful recovery, economic recovery of Ukraine in the next generation without Russia being involved in that process. What, what has yeah. happened since 2014 is actually, uh, uh, there's been a lot written on this, uh, the deformation of the Ukrainian economy mm -hmm. under the careful administrations of the former president, Petro Poroshenko, who destroyed the industrial base, largely located mm -hmm. in the East, uh, for his own political reasons, and uh, followed the advice of some of his Western advisors to create out of Ukraine an agricultural superpower. This was, I think, the advice uh, given to him by Jeffrey Pyatt, the former U.S. ambassador uh, to Ukraine. But the problem is, ultimately, that, uh, to be frank, there are no in, uh, agricultural superpowers. Uh, there are uh, uh, agricultural lenders and people who, you know, produce uh, for other nations, uh, but that does not put them on uh, th that alone, that alone does not put them on a sufficiently independent economic standing that actually makes them dependent on their buyers and suppliers. Coming back to the issue of Russian speaking culture within Ukraine, um, and th this is a question that has been raised by certain Ukrainian uh, speakers as well. Uh, with the present cultural policies of the Ukrainian state, in your view, would it in fact be possible for Ukraine to reintegrate Crimea and the Eastern Donbass in, in, and their populations in, into Ukraine? Um, so the, the, uh, or... the legal foundation uh, for the policy uh, called reintegration uh, and, a, and uh, the legal framework uh, for it that the Ukrainian state has indicated, the Ukrainian government has indicated that it intends to apply both to Donbass and Crimea is two-pronged. One is uh, the retention of all the current restrictions that exist throughout Ukraine on the public use of Russian um, and the likely extension of that. But uh, even as it is today, one is not allowed uh, to use Russian in public settings without the possibility that that usage could be denounced by your interlocutor, uh, and you could be fined for that. No, not foreigners, I suspect, but actual Ukrainian citizens, um, if, uh, if they persist in their use of Ukrainian. But that's one aspect of the policy. The other aspect of the policy, and this uh, is clearly stated in uh, the legal framework, 
and I describe it partly in my book because it's been around for several years, is the um, deportation of individuals from those regions who do not meet the appropriate criteria for being uh, a Ukrainian citizen at that point, and, or essentially flaunting the laws by choosing to speak Russian, or by wanting to, or by encouraging the use of. And um, those people uh, are will be encouraged to leave. How exactly? I'm, you know, I don't know. The current, uh, the current Minister of Defense, Reznikov was in fact in charge of um, the, uh, the these territories for the, the policy for reintegration of these territories. And um, he has a famous article, I think in Ukrainska Pravda, which says, uh, which, which the, the title of which was, I don't like the word deportation, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> but then <laughs> you go through it and it says, but that may be necessary for the salvation of the Ukrainian state. And again, there's nothing surprising, there's nothing new about this. This simply reiterates and gives, again, uh, a uh, legal and state foundation to policies that have been in the repertoire of Ukrainian nationalism since the 1930s. But given that deportations, of course, have also occurred uh, on the Russian side, are in fact the populations being pulled apart in ways that will make reconciliation in future impossible? Well, the future is a long time. <laughs> and that's my optimistic assumption. Uh, that I, we can look back to conflicts in the past uh, that w one would have thought people could never be reconciled. You can speak about England and Ireland. I can speak about uh, Mexico and the United States. Um, one would have thought that there'd be no possibility, and yet time heals maybe not all wounds, but many wounds. And the process of healing itself engenders more healing. That's why I think it's very important to move as quickly as possible to a ceasefire. So, because I think that at least opens the door to the possibility of further peacemaking, which begins the process of reconciliation, which begins the process of healing, which will take a very long time. But but that is the path. That is the path to reconciliation. Who will be there to be reconciled? Whoever is there. <laughs> Whoever is left in Ukraine and in Russia. And most importantly, and I think we shouldn't forget this, the border regions on both sides are cousins. They are directly related. Um, and whatever else happens in a family over time, uh, not, a, not all the time, obviously, but often enough, if your parents can't talk to each other, then the children don't necessarily remember why that was. And the grandchildren have an even harder time understanding. I grew up at the tail end of a generation that had experienced World War II. And when I was very young, I remember the hostility that was directed toward my German relatives in countries like Holland when we went there every summer for vacation. Uh, it was natural for a certain generation to express themselves that way. But by the time I was a young man, and maybe 
dating <laughs> and you know just just hanging out with young people these issues were distant memories to us and didn't really affect our personal relations and i imagine well i can just look at my children <laughs> and they they don't get excited about any of the things that i deplore <laughs> you know they have their own lives and their own interests and uh, maybe this will change and they'll they'll become more rigid in their views over time but about different things they'll, they'll have their own issues uh, to be incensed about, but they will not be my issues. And and I think realism, that, that's a realistic assessment of what happens in history. Hate, I think, is the hardest thing to sustain. It's much easier to lose hate as time passes. That's a natural process. Yes, I mean, a, a problem, however, <sighs> And also, I mean, when when it comes to the whole question of the you know Russian speaking identity within Ukraine and the Russian Ukrainian identity, is that it's often seemed to me that Putin has pursued two radically in contradictory agendas in Ukraine since 2014. The the, the first is indeed to uh, you know claim to be defending a Russian Ukrainian identity. But the other is to break off bits of Ukraine and annex them to Russia, including now the bit, bits that have been conquered over the past year. And surely, I mean, these two agendas are, are totally incompatible. You can't do both. Uh, if you support the one, then you should be, you know, as Putin has sometimes said, you know, supporting equal cultural rights for Russians within Ukraine. But uh, you can't do that and simultaneously try to to break off and seize uh, which is speaking areas of Ukraine. Right, which is precisely why I am least interested in Russia's objectives and most concerned in my assessment uh, of what needs to happen to strengthen Ukraine and to give it the internal wherewithal to resist foreign depredations is precisely the reconciliation of the various strands of Ukrainian identity. It is, it will be of much greater significance, I feel, how Ukrainians themselves feel about that aspect of their identity in southern and eastern Ukraine than what Russia wishes to impose. And I've always stressed, and I found this to be true, that Russian speakers in Ukraine are Ukrainians first, and they rarely, if ever, uh, as I've encountered them, rarely, if ever, identify with Russian <laughs> politics or with Russia's political agenda. They do, however, have their own agenda for themselves and their country. And it's almost unfortunate that in the discourse we talk about, we label them as Russian speakers, rather than saying Ukrainians, who hmm. happen to also speak Russian in addition to Ukrainian and feel that connectivity. But to emphasize that first word, that they are Ukrainians, because right now, one of the great uh, factors limiting the, the healing of Ukraine and its, and its rebirth, I think, as, as, a, as a strong um, nation, as a, as a nation state, an integral nation state, is its the inability of the government to know to, to to deal with this group of the population because it is pursuing a mono ethnic policy rather than a pluri ethnic policy and i think that is tremendously short sighted and i hope although i fear it might be i hope it is not ultimately suicidal <laughs> 
two, two things have struck me, one for a very long time, and by the way, I think this is also true in Belarus, but certainly in the Donbass and other areas of, of eastern Ukraine, it wasn't that the population were loyal to Russia. I think there's a difference here uh, with Crimea for no. obvious historical reasons. They were much more like um, Soviet loyalists, really. Yeah, you know, and, and they enough. believed in uh, the, the Soviet Union of Peoples. That did not mean in the past that they wanted to be regions of Russia uh, any right. more than people in, you know, um, Ukraine or Odessa today do. Right. Uh, of course, something else there, which uh, I, like so many people, was struck by at the beginning of, of the Russian invasion, and, and subsequently, therefore, particularly disappointed perhaps by uh, some Ukrainian moves, is of course when Russia invaded, uh, and clearly there was the hope on the part of the Russian government <laughs> that many, whatever you want to call them, Russian Ukrainians would rally to support the invasion. And a large majority and their elected representatives did not. And that was, you know, widely and correctly publicized at the time by the Ukrainian government, you know, that our Russian speaking citizens have remained loyal to Ukraine. Uh, I have to say that especially you know under the government of president zelensky i had expected this to become the basis for uh precisely the declaration of uh, a ukrainian you know a very powerful ukrainian civic nationalism which had right. demonstrated its strength through the loyalty of its citizens but unfortunately quite the opposite seems to have occurred a, a, a ukraine as an open society uh, or a civic a civic society or one in which nationalism, uh, civic nationalism was preferred to ethnic, to ethnic nationalism. It hasn't happened, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. One of the things that you have suggested might be, uh, you raised the possibility uh, in your questions of, uh, what does the future hold uh, for this population, particularly should it shrink? And I think it will. I think it will shrink both through immigration, uh, really regardless of the outcome. I mean, wh wherever, wh wherever the boundaries are finally drawn, there will be some immigration away. Um, and uh, those most devoted in Eastern and Southern and elsewhere, Ukraine, to that Russian aspect of their identity will, will probably not feel comfortable staying in a highly nationalized Ukraine. Um, but I would, uh, I find it hard to conceive of uh, the country a future Ukraine, even if that number were to shrink significantly below 40%, I don't think it would shrink below 10%. In other words, I think there will always be this residue and 10% and is to me a political, politically and culturally significant constituency that certainly the EU would have to take notice of and, and step in to provide uh, some sort of recourse to if, um, if you, the Ukrainian government were to pursue truly um, exclusionary policies at their expense. Now, there is the example of the Baltic states which I haven't followed very carefully, but I understand there continue to be tensions there on this very issue. And uh, sometimes uh, certain EU bodies have spoken up on behalf of uh, those my Russian language minorities in those countries, and sometimes they haven't. Much will depend on the international context. After the war, ends, however, we will have a new international context in which these concerns will become, again, much more important in the context of building the future Europe that presumably most people want to live in. 
and uh, the fact that th these minority rights are put on the back burner now, I think is really temporary. And uh, it would behoove Ukrainian politicians to think about that future and how their own cultural policies will fit into a broader European institutional context. I've already channeled um, some questions of which there, there are a, a huge number, uh, but moving on to questions from the audience, I know some of these, you know, are, are beyond the, the bounds of the book, but since you are a leading expert, could you say something about how you might see possible paths to a peace settlement? I mean, beyond a ceasefire, which you've already spoken of. Can, can you lay out your vision of, of what the terms of an eventual peace settlement might look like that uh, Western voters should be advocating for and um, trying to influence their political leaders to advocate? Not really. <laughs> I, I, um, there's so many variables that uh, parsing them is literally the job of teams of negotiators. But I do think there is a logical sequence to be pursued. And it is in that spirit that I uh, understand the Chinese initiatives and similar initiatives that I've read about undertaken by the Vatican. And of course, what we now know about the initiatives that were pursued by former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. And what unites all three of those is the following sequence. First, cease fire. Um, a, a, a separation of the forces and some uh, status quo on the ground that ends the fighting. After that, th it is precisely the ending of the fighting that opens the door to longer term negotiations over a peace settlement. However, that peace settlement, the one thing that strikes me as uh, vital to their success is that they be uh, multi-tiered. In other words, that they on the one hand serve to guarantee Ukraine's security and sec security concerns, and at the same time that they establish or that they become part <laughs> of a larger pan-European security arrangement, which uh, because it was, because it never came about after the end of the Cold War, left uh, so many unanswered questions for Russia about its role in Europe and for Europeans about their objectives in Eastern Europe and toward Russia. So it seems to me that uh, if we could first secure a ceasefire uh, with a, a true commitment out of that ceasefire to pursue um, negotiations, these negotiations should be pursued both on a bilateral and pan-European level. Then I think the coming, once this all could come to, then it could all come together um, into a package that I think would be promising for a long-term security arrangement, for, for long-term stability in Europe. Because as I understand, one of the legitimate Ukraine's concerns is that, well, if we negotiate with Russia, who's to say that five or 10 years from now, Russia will not use this lull in order to attack Ukraine again? And it is precisely the broader pan-European context into which Russia must be drawn and invited that strikes me as the carrot that that could <laughs> succeed in that. 
But do you think that this is possible uh, as long as Putin remains in power? Because uh, I, I think we both agree that, you know, we can condemn so many actions by the West and indeed by the Ukrainian government. But still, in the end, uh, this illegal, this criminal invasion was Putin's own decision. Well, <laughs> The choice, <laughs> you negotiate with your counterpart, whoever that is. That's, that's real diplomacy. <laughs> uh, it's easy to pick and choose, but the people you can choose to have a deal with are not necessarily the people who matter. That you have to negotiate with your opponents. Now, uh, if the West decides there shall be no negotiations with Putin, then the immediate uh, the, the, the immediate uh, people who suffer as a result will be the Ukrainians, first and foremost. Of course, the Russians as well, um, and Europeans. We'll, we'll, we would all suffer. The most immediate group to suffer and whose suffering will be prolonged by the refusal to negotiate, to even discuss the possibility of negotiations with Putin would be the Ukrainians themselves. And that would be an awful outcome if that could be prevented by negotiating with the devil himself. I mean, after all, it was Churchill who said after Hitler invaded the Soviet Union that he would think about making a positive reference to the devil in the House uh, of Commons. <laughs> yeah, yes, he did indeed. And that is realism for you. Yeah, um, one question is, do you think, you know, we have seen in the Western media and also in Western academia, uh, some very uh, apocalyptic language uh, about this war, but also about Russia um, and some to me, I have to say, very disturbing, almost racist language about, you know, not just the Putin regime, not just about the contemporary Russian state, but about Russian culture in general. Uh, I mean, in your view, is this contributing to um, the difficulty? Uh, well, is it a contributing to the internal difficulties of Ukraine that you have um, sketched? And is it uh, also contributing to the difficulty of moving towards, at some stage, a compromise peace? Well, I think it's axiomatic that the demonization of your enemies cannot lead to reconciliation. Um, so, if you wish to have peace, you must indeed find in your interlocutor the uh, qualities that you are willing to value, uh, whoever that, that counterpart is. Um, again, we don't I think it was Bismarck who said, you know, I don't have the luxury of choosing my ideal counterparts. I have to deal with the people that exist and that have the power. So um, uh, demonizing people, cultures, well, when has that ever led to anything positive? I just, uh, I, I just simply, see it as a, as a dead end. Uh, and it frankly just gives more ammunition to Putin to argue that the West is out to get Russia. It's just, it just feeds into, sometimes I'm, I'm amazed at how, how, not, how neatly some Western uh, extreme rhetoric fits into the Kremlin narrative. And they think they're opposing mm -hmm. Russia. They think they're opposing Putin when they're actually strengthening him. It's remarkable. There is one thing that also comes out of some of the questions. Um, is Putin, uh, sorry, we're now moving beyond Ukraine, but uh, is Putin in a Russian context now, 
Could he be seen as a relative moderate? Or to put it a different way, it has always seemed to me that Putin is a, a state nationalist. He is a, uh, he represents, uh, as he has himself written, uh, a multi-ethnic Russia, in which, of course, the Russian people, the Russian language will have the senior position, but in which, you know, everybody should be equal. And his uh, his own regime, by the way, does uh, actually bear that out to some extent, if you look at its ethnic composition. Yeah. But uh, are we seeing, as a result of this war, a lurch within Russia to a much narrower and more you know, ethnic chauvinist version of Russian nationalism, which of course would uh, then, uh, um, you know, contribute. Well, I, I mean, it would be, of course be a nightmare for Russia's own ethnic and ethno-religious minorities, but it yeah. would also have uh, sinister implications for relations with Russia's neighbours. Yes, I, I must confess, I don't see that transformation in the domestically oriented rhetoric. Uh, you know, there's not like Russians, not Tatars, you know, or something like that. Um, as so the evolution that I've seen is one from uh, Putin uh, asserting more or less be and, and standing at the vanguard in Russian society of arguing that Russia is part of the West. We, we the are- The Third part, West, as it used right, to be. But not, so right. not that we have to do this or do that to catch up. It's really the West that must undergo a certain change in its own attitude in order to welcome us back to the table because we're ready, here we are, and why don't we get, get started? Uh, with this reintegration. And uh, obviously then came the Munich speech of 2007, and subsequently there has been more um, and more <clears throat> a shift away from that, which I'm sure the Kremlin interprets as the result of the rejection by the West of Russia's offer to join it. And instead, uh, the formation of a new eastward looking multi ethnic Rasiski, more than just Russian concept. And I think of this as something along the lines of Russian Eurasia. So there is a, there is to be, if there isn't already, a Eurasian civilization. And Russia forms the anchor for this Eurasian civilization, which includes many different components. Um, but that is clearly, sadly, from my perspective, turned its back on Europe. Now, when a political leadership turns its back on one part of its heritage and directs itself another, that doesn't mean, I've always argued, it doesn't mean it's the end of that strand of thinking. That strand is still there. And it could always reemerge in subsequent generations under visionary leaders with different objectives, different ambitions. There's always an, an ebb and flow to the tide of history. Um, but right now, um, under Putin uh, 2 or 3.0, <laughs> uh, he is directed toward, toward reinforcing Russia's Eurasian identity in order to push a, a, a greater connection both south toward the Turkic peoples and eastward toward China. And geostrategically, that may not be an unwise choice <laughs> because people, many Russian thinkers for centuries have argued that Russia's caboose 
in Siberia has been too neglected. I don't know if Putin has the wherewithal, the vision, or the resources to really create that eastward expansion. But it is something that a Russian visionary Russian thinkers since the time of Lomonosov have argued uh, will is will be at the basis of Russia being truly a a in 18th century terms a superpower. Hmm. Well, we will see. As you said, the future is a long business. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nikolai. That was a fascinating conversation. Once again, I urge you all to buy Nikolai's book, The Tragedy of Ukraine. Uh, and uh, before leaving, I would just like to say that we are having a, another uh, panel uh, next week on Wednesday the 8th uh, with two authors, Dominique Carell and Jesse Driscoll, uh, about their book, um, on uh, Ukraine's unnamed war, on the origins uh, of the uh, of the Ukraine conflict, which I hope will deepen uh, all our understandings of how this tragedy came to be. So thank you all so much. I'm sorry the uh, 51 questions, I, so I had to sort of cram them together. Uh, but thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Nikolai, for a, a fascinating discussion. My pleasure. Goodbye.